Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Journey Discussions. I'm Troy Kilpatrick, the Executive Director for the Journey Museum and Learning Center. And I want to thank you for taking the time to join us live here tonight for our special journey discussion on forgiving 2020, something that I think probably all of us have been working on in some form. And tonight, uh, we're blessed to have Dr. Chris Heacock uh, lead the discussion and provide us uh, some thoughts on how to forgive and how to move forward. And I think it was a really special conversation, uh, given everything that's happened. Everybody got change uh, that we weren't expecting. And so as you've signed in tonight, maybe you've joined us for a previous uh, journey discussion. You're going to be able to ask questions. I will send out a chat to all of you. You can ask them throughout the course of the PowerPoint presentation tonight. I'll gather those. And at the end of the presentation, Dr. Chris uh, will answer some of the questions for you guys. And, and we hope we can fill in uh, the gaps of everything. Uh, if you have not joined us for a journey discussion before, you can find some of our prior programs over at journeymuseum.org. Check it out. We've had some really awesome stuff that's come out. We've had Dr. Shankar Kura from Monument Health talking about COVID-19. We celebrated Perseverance landing on Mars last week as an example of another journey discussion. And we've talked with Mount Rushmore, the Mount Rushmore vision uh, earlier in the month of February. Coming up next Thursday, we're going to have author photographer Jeff Dale talk to, we're going to go on a peaceful journey. Uh, Dr. Chris, we're on self-meditation and self-healing here right now for the next week or two. We're forgiving 2020, and then we're going on a peaceful journey and looking at some beautiful photography from all around the world. Uh, Jeff, this is Jeff's first book. Uh, so uh, what an interesting time for him to come out with it here in 2021, again, after all things pandemic. And uh, uh, he's got some interesting thoughts that, that we'll be able to share. And I think it'll be a really, it's going to be a really great program. I was previewing part of our video here uh, earlier and it, you know, I was there, but I mean, I think you will all enjoy a peaceful journey next Thursday. And then coming up on a special day, um, March 7th, that's a Sunday. We have Paul Priest and Paul is the sole survivor from the Battle of Remagen. Okay, um, this battle helped turn the World War efforts around, uh, and it it was the theme of this battle. The bridge there uh, tr was later uh, dramatized as the bridge over the River Kwai. Uh, Kwai. Boy, I couldn't say that there for a second. Um, so this is a real historic thing. Uh, Paul is a veteran living right here. Uh, in Rapid City, uh, and we wanted to do it on the actual day of, and so it'll be a little different than on a Thursday night. Uh, it'll be a Sunday afternoon, which you were used to come to our learning forums on a Sunday afternoon. We're going to go and pivot and do a two o'clock. So watch our emails, go to journeymuseum.org for all of that. Um, Dr. Chris Heacock, uh, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows she is the chair of the Journey Museum and Learning Center's Board of Directors, the Museum Alliance of Rapid City. And, you know, there's never any coincidences in life. Uh, uh, with everything that happened last year, and I know I've told Chris this personally, but now I'm going to tell the audience, I think we were really lucky that she was our chair because our world just got, everything just got changed instantly. And I, I am personally very grateful for her volunteerism, her leadership, her patience with all things 2020 here at The Journey. I know myself and our team is forever thankful for her many years of service on our board of directors, and I think at a very appropriate time uh, in 2020. And she's, you know, not only doing this in 2020, but she's our chair in 2021 uh, as we continue to find what is the way we're going to, we've been changing and we'll talk about change tonight. How will we change uh, and get to the next level? Uh, Chris is married to Roger many, many years. Uh, you may recognize uh, he's home now underfoot, huh, Chris? So that, that could be a challenge. That's a change for you guys, right? Roger, thank you for your uh, sharing of Chris. Two daughters, 
Um, a little bit about Chris. She's got so many degrees. She never really brags about them, but I, I, I asked Alyssa to make sure I talk about this University of South Dakota, South Dakota State. So there's no coyote or jackrabbit favoritism. <laughs> And Walden, oh. <laughs> right down the middle, didn't you? And then Walden University. Uh, Chris has a doctorate in psychology. She's been re researching for seven years this whole topic of forgiveness. Um, and she has been involved uh, and taught high school, college students, social sciences, history, math, critical thinking, human re relations and religion, wisdom traditions, um, Chris has just been involved in, in all kinds of things, respecting ethnic and cultural heritage, trainer, a civil discourse program coordinator for Rapid City Public Schools. And again, not to be understated, our chair for our board of directors here at the Journey Museum and Learning Center, Dr. Chris, uh, I am going to turn the computer over to you so you, uh, you can grab the screen and share your PowerPoint. And folks, again, you can send me questions. I will send a prompt out while Chris is setting all that up. And thank you for joining us on a journey discussion for Forgiving 2020. So 2020 was a tough year. And I talked to a lot of people who were so excited at December 31st, because finally 2020 was going to be over. It was it was a toughie. One of sad statistic that I just read yesterday was a study that found that about half of Americans felt that their mental health was harmed um, because of the COVID situation. So we experienced to different degrees because for some of us, it was harder than others. But there was hardship. For some, it may have just been not having enough toilet paper. But for others, it was job loss, not being able to put food on the table or pay the rent or get health care. Grief, over 500,000 lives lost and some really sad things with maybe not being able to be with loved ones. Um, and I also facilitate a grief group. And we've talked about just all the different types of grief besides just losing a loved one. We grieved maybe not getting to do our high school graduation, not being able to be in school with our friends for young people, um, for older people, not being able to eat with others or get loved ones visits. A lot of different forms of, of grief. Loneliness was a big factor. And then for almost everybody, uncertainty. It was very mysterious that the coronavirus was at first and so many different things were happening. Politics were divisive. We had a lot of rancor there and we had some natural disasters in different places. So it was, it was a tough time. And so I've heard a lot of people say, let's get back to normal. We wanna, we wanna get back to normal. Um, however, I might agree with the mother in the cartoon I'm showing you here when asked, well, mom, what's normal? I think maybe it's just a setting on the dryer. Um, it's hard to, to know what normal is sometimes, especially because life keeps changing. And forgiveness is something that's all about not being normal. When we have something to forgive, it's because things didn't go the way we wanted them to. Um, our expectations were not met. met. Um, we, we suffered. We had pain, that type of thing. Things weren't normal. And so forgiveness is what can help us get through these times when things aren't normal, when life doesn't act the way we want it to act, and when we're going through some tough stuff. So the first thing I always talk about when I talk about forgiveness is what do you mean by forgiveness? Because people describe it in a lot of different ways. So through our the presentation, I'll talk first about what is forgiveness, why we'd want to forgive, and then how, how we forgive. So what do we mean by forgiveness? I interviewed um, a number of different people with different sacred belief systems who had forgiven a major transgression. And one of the men that I interviewed used this quote as something that helps with forgiveness as well as helps us understand the meaning of it. Before we sit down to talk, let us define our terms. It's always important to know and communicate clearly. So let's talk about what forgiveness is. You may be heard letting go for forgiveness. And that is a term that is often used to describe forgiveness. And for 2020, 
a lot of our forgiveness is going to be letting go of the desire for a different past. 2020 was not what it was supposed to be. It didn't act the way it was supposed to act. And it can be really hard to accept that. Sometimes we fight what, what happened in the past. So acceptance is going to be a big big goal of forgiveness, accepting whatever happened that wasn't supposed to happen. So we can look at this as one of our definitions of forgiveness, accepting what happened that wasn't supposed to happen. I also like to always really clarify that forgiveness is not ignoring, excusing, or condoning abuse, bad behavior, oppression, any of those things. Because sometimes people are really reluctant to forgive because they think somebody's going to get by with something or that it's gonna excuse something, or um, you're condoning what they did. But true genuine forgiveness is actually just the opposite. It means really looking at whatever happened, uncovering it, confronting it, eyes wide open, and looking at that event and figuring out how to deal with it in a just way, as well as a compassionate way. It also doesn't mean forgetting. Because if we start trying to just forget something that was major, I mean, if you're for, you want to just forget something, if like somebody gave you a, a dirty look and, and it wasn't even meant to be a dirty look, well, that's the kind of stuff you can forget. But not a major transgression, not if you've really been hurt, either by yourself, you did something you're really ashamed of, others, um, or whatever happened. So it really means having the courage to really confront that painful, hurtful event. And one of the people I interviewed said to remember with eyes wide open, um, to just really look at it clearly. And then the goal is to go from like the picture, um, from a dreary, sad memory to something that you can get light to, that can be more um, rejuvenating. In psychology, we talk about three main types of forgiveness. There's others too, but the three main types we'll, we'll address are forgiveness of self, forgiveness of other, and forgiveness of a situation. And during 2020, we may have had a variety of all three. Um, because it was a tough time, we may have had problems ourselves. I know I talked to like parents who were feeling bad that they had such a hard time trying to work and, and um, homeschool their kids and just keep up with everything and had some of that parent guilt. Um, so forgiving ourselves, being compassionate, it was a tough time. Forgiving others. We had to worry about forgiving people who either did wear masks or didn't wear masks. We had political divisions. People maybe said things that they wish they hadn't. And so we've got things going on where we wanna think about how we can forgive each other for maybe hurtful things that we said because we were stressed and anxious and um, did some things that maybe we aren't real proud of. And then forgiveness of a situation, like forgiving 2020, sometimes we're upset or angry about what happened, but there's no person to blame. And hopefully we don't take it out on someone, but sometimes it's disease and natural disasters and just random accidents that can make us feel really angry. And sometimes we get angry at a God figure, angry at God or fate. We can ask questions like, well, why me? We talked about how 2020 was harder on some people than others. And so why me? Why is it, why is it me that had to suffer like this? And that can really be hard on us to, to question that and feel like we're the victims of a really horrible situation. And it's unfair. So why forgive? And this also has to do with forgiving in a genuine in-depth way. Sometimes forgiveness can be approached the wrong way. Like if you're told, well, just why don't you hurry up and forgive? Can't you get over it? We can sometimes put pressure on people that way, but true forgiveness often takes time and it's very individual. And if we have forgiven, the reasons why we would do it is one, growth. The people that I interviewed all felt that they had been transformed that they'd learned something that they could move forward. They feel like they had grown and learned. And that's one of the beautiful things about forgiveness. You're, you're able to, to become. Personal well-being. You forgive the people I interviewed, talked about 
they didn't have high blood pressure anymore. One man was almost losing his eyesight until he was able to, to forgive and let go, um, sleep better, feel much more free, liberating. Those were the things that people used as words to describe being able to forgive. Um, living a health, being able to just live a healthier life because you're more at peace. Relationships should improve. Um, one of the, the Muslim men that I interviewed talked about how um, a cloud was lifted when he forgave. When he stepped on his emotions and his pride, he was able to suddenly lift that cloud and communicate better with people. Um, sometimes you have to set some boundaries and sometimes maybe you have to leave a relationship. At times, someone else is on a developmental path that is not going to bring them to a place where they can be safe. And it's really important to be safe. You can't let go of something until you're out of danger. And so you work on it until you feel safe. You may have to set boundaries. One of the ladies that I um, interviewed had an interesting story that really illustrated that. She worked in a, the field of construction and she worked with a lot of men and it wasn't real pretty. She was getting really mad at them because she felt they were taking advantage of her, bossing her around, that type of thing. And she was very angry inside, rage. So what she finally did is she got, she did get mad, but she set, set her boundary and said, no more. And she told him off. And what happened was they respected her more. And she finally set that boundary because she spoke up for herself. And then she was able to not see them as objects of hurt and rage at them, but instead start seeing them as fellow human beings who had the human condition just like everyone else. And so she was able to start forgiving once she set her boundaries. Another thing I like to think of with forgiving is it's for giving. And once we're able to let go of some of those burdens that we carry, if we're unforgiving, we can start giving more to others. If we're like some called it locked in a personal prison of unforgiveness, it's really hard. We're so focused on ourselves that oftentimes we can't see what we're, um, how we're hurting others. And so it allows us then to give to others. So those are the three main categories of why to forgive that I found from the people that I interviewed. This is a diagram on the forgiveness experience that I put together with the research that I did that applies to the people that I interviewed. And they all forgave a major transgression from murder to torture, to abusive parents, to um, an unfaithful boyfriend, a variety of different major things that were hurtful to them. And you'll notice with the reaction to a major transgression, oftentimes it's either our fight or flight instinct that kicks in. If we're in flight, we may just try to repress what's bothering us. We may feel shameful. We may avoid whatever it is that's, that's bothering us if we're in flight mode. If we're in fight mode, we might try to be vengeful. We're gonna make sure nobody takes advantage of us. We're gonna blame others. We're gonna deny any responsibility. It's not our fault, it's their fault, and I'm gonna get after them and I'm gonna make sure they pay. Forgiveness route, we have to upshift our thinking. We have to use our cerebral cortex and we have to think of a way to deal with a transgression that is gonna produce those benefits that we talked about, the growth, better relationships, the personal well-being. And how do we do that? We can make the decision once we understand what forgiveness is to forgive, and then we have to do the work. And what I found with the people that I interviewed was that they had what I call the four C's. The first thing was they had connections. Nobody did it alone. They had guidance and supportive connections that helped them. And then they had the courage, the compassion, and the creativity to go ahead and look at things differently, to be able to get that new path forward. And I really admired the people that I interviewed. And so I call them my forgiveness heroes because they went from victim to hero. They were able to write that new chapter in their life story and transform what was very, very painful into something that, that could still be painful, but, but they learned from it 
and it became something much more beautiful. So the four C's we'll talk about in more detail then, the connections, the courage, the compassion, and the creativity. And these are the four C's of how to forgive. The first thing that helps with the other three C's is connections. Connections to whatever your religious, spiritual, or social network may be. The people I interviewed were from 10 different sacred belief systems and they um, went ahead and told me what those were. They were self-described sacred belief systems. And some of them had a religious community. Some of them had a very spiritual um, connection. Some of them, it was more family and friends. Often it was a combination of both. Some of them had therapists, some of them didn't, but they all had connections. They, none of them did it alone. They all reached out and they got support and they got guidance. One of the important things is that that support was non-judgmental. To be for, to really have genuine in-depth forgiveness, we have to be genuine. We have to be honest with ourselves. If something's hurting, um, if we have pride and things we don't want to uh, accept, it's important to just come out with those things, to be genuine. And if we have someone who feels will listen to us and not judge us, but will let us get our true feelings out without that judgment, um, that's, what's, that's what's really helpful. After I did a presentation, one man came up and said he really liked it. And I asked him, you know, what what he what was his favorite thing? And he said, I loved it that you made didn't make forgiveness sound easy. He said he'd been told by so many people, just get over it. Um, how come how come you're having such trouble moving on? And he said that just added to his shame, just made him feel worse. So we have to be careful to not press too hard, but to be there to just listen. Another man who had to get over forgiving um, himself for his part, it was an accident, it was totally an accident, but he still felt responsible for the death of his supervisor um, because of a decision that he had encouraged. And one of the things he said was the most wonderful thing is that the people around him just listened and let him get over it in his own time. And so non-judgmental support and comfort is really important. So is that compassionate guidance and having a role model. The people I interviewed talked about the role models, the people that inspired them to forgive. One example I'll give you was a man who'd grown up with all sorts of prejudice and hurt on the um, reservation and all the, the horror that can come with that and the hate that can come with that. And he was having a hard time with true deep forgiveness because of all the, um, the prejudice and the discrimination that he and his family had encountered. And his role model that he gave so much credit to was black pastors who'd had even worse situations in the Jim Crow South when one man he, he talked about had seen his, his um, sister burned to death with no justice afterwards. And he said, boy, I thought if they can forgive, what's wrong with me if I can't? And he asked them, how do you do it? And they said, we pray and we talk about it. We pray and we talk about it. And so again, that compassionate guidance and support is so very important. I asked everybody that I interviewed to describe their own sacred beliefs, what was important to them, what gave life meaning to them. And I'll just add that spirituality, mental health, physical health, all of those are pretty tied together. Um, so the World Health Organization has now realized that and psychology is realizing it more and more too, how our spiritual, mental and physical health are all tied together. I was asked to talk a little about different cultures and their views on forgiveness. And what I found, and I've taught world religions, wisdom traditions, and what you find is that all cultures value forgiveness and all cultures value the golden rule. And I show this cartoon, the golden rule isn't that whoever has the goal make, whoever has the gold makes the rules, even though it may seem like that's also a golden rule. Um, what the golden rule is, is to treat other people the way you would like to be treated with respect. And there's some form of the golden rule in all the different um, religions. 
forgiveness is a virtue in all the different religions as well. And to answer that question, why do we need forgiveness? Well, you've heard the expression, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Um, what forgiveness does is it helps create a stable society, a society um, in which people are not just seeking vengeance, but seeking healing and seeking to move forward. And so literature from the world's religions all contain themes of forgiveness. And I'm going to share some with you just to give some examples. I'll go back to the Greeks and read the Iliad. Um, you know that an understanding was reached when common humanity was um, seen between the people in the, in the Iliad. And the Greek word for reaching an understanding, gnomi then, was used also by Aristotle. And he talked about the need for understanding for two reasons. And I, I like the way he summed it up. He said, we all need that understanding, that forgiveness, because as human beings, we often make mistakes because we're ignorant. We don't know any better. We, you know, we regret what we did, and, but we didn't realize um, how bad it was going to be or what the consequence would be. Another reason was, again, going back to our instincts, we just react. Um, we're under stress. We're angry. We don't control ourselves. We don't have that self-control. And so we do things we regret then, too. And so that need for, for understanding is um, perennial. Looking at some of the major religions, one of the things that, especially once I started researching forgiveness that really struck me about the Lord's Prayer, Christianity's Lord's Prayer, is where forgiveness came in the Lord's Prayer. Notice, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. So right after the need for survival bread for food, we've got the need for forgiveness. And I think to me that shows just how essential forgiveness is to life. Um, the quote that I picked from Islam is also another bit of wisdom that you'll see in all the religions. Repel evil by that deed which is better. And then the one whom between you and him is enmity or hate will become as though a devoted friend. And you see that in quotes like by Martin Luther King um, Jr. who said the only way to combat hate is with love and to combat darkness is with light. So that would be another piece of wisdom. I picked from the Talmud of Judaism, a scripture that speaks to the oneness of all people, because that's another similarity in all the different religions, is the unity and oneness of all people. And because of that oneness, the Talmud describes someone who seeks vengeance as someone who, having cut one hand while handling the knife, avenges himself by stabbing the other hand. In other words, when we hurt others, we're, we're hurting ourselves. And when we hurt ourselves, we're hurting others. Um, we're all connected. And the oneness of all people is, is one of the reasons for forgiveness. From Hindu scripture, I picked a quote about the fact that humility is important. We all mess up. Being human is hard. Um, it's hard for all of us and we all have struggles. And so it says a noble soul will ever exercise compassion, even toward those who enjoy injuring others or those of cruel deeds for who is without fault. You can find quotes by Gandhi who said, you know, the reason I'm compassionate is because I know that I also have, have mistakes and faults and that type of thing. So that humility, being able to um, be aware of our weaknesses as well as our strengths. The Eastern religions often feel that reincarnation takes care of a lot of forgiveness because if we don't get it right, we're going to have to be born again in another reincarnation until we get it right. And even some of the people I interviewed with the, the other religions said, hey, you know, I want to I want to be ready for the next life. I want to I want to have good moral character. I don't want to be full of vengeance and hate and that type of thing. Um, so reincarnation and karma can be one way to look at it as can just we want to be we want to improve ourselves we want to be transformed buddhist tradition speaks in terms of two concepts for forgiveness and 
I think that's very appropriate, combining forbearance and compassion, because it's hard to be compassionate towards anyone who's hurt us. And it can also be very hard to be compassionate towards ourselves when we mess up and, and disappoint ourselves. And with the people I interviewed, we talked about that, which is harder, self or other forgiveness. Most of them said self-forgiveness um, because we often tend to be harder on ourselves than anybody else. But forbearance, being able to be patient when people don't act the way we think they should, be patient with ourselves and have that compassion. The Tao, which is a um, religion originating in China, have a phrase that also goes along with the different religions as far as having integrity or being the person that you should be. Um, notice the wise act well without demanding others do. Oftentimes we have these mirror neurons in our brains and so they can be helpful in when we copy good behavior, but they can also be bad when we just copy bad behavior. You're mean. No, you're mean. Um, I hate you. No, I hate you. Um, we just reciprocate in the same way. And so when we do that, we oftentimes don't get any further and we don't act with integrity. So the doubt calls it someone who ignores natural goodness is always concerned that they are properly honored. We get very prideful. We need to be honored. Someone who knows natural goodness honors their side of the relationship regardless more into integrity, um, being the person, one of um, the women I interviewed that was agnostic said, be true to yourself. She said, if I, if she had a, um, a boyfriend who cheated on her and she said, if I would have acted the same way, I would have been as bad as him. I, I wanna have integrity, I wanna be true to myself. I interviewed two people who were Lakota, one whose main religion was um, Christianity and the other who was a pipe carrier and followed the red road. And Lakota values are the same values that the major religions have. Um, and that is something that can be agreed on. Fortitude, wisdom, courage, generosity, honor, respect, and humility are those Lakota values that are so important. And you've probably heard of, we are, all, we are all related, we are one. And, you know, we've heard, we hear that with the different um, religions as well. So being able to have those, those values and stick to them. One of the things you'll find with studies, if you're looking for differences in religion, there's more differences in the way people practice their religion than there is in the wisdom of the religions. So some people really value forgiveness whereas others might put more value on justice and punishment and making sure people pay. And so that can be in any religion. So the values are the same, but people sometimes choose to emphasize or ignore um, certain values or virtues. So I'll get back to the four C's. We already talked about connections and let's talk a little about courage. Um, notice the, the courageous mouse in the picture I have for you. It's not the absence of fear, but the judgment that something else is more important than fear. And that goes back to the integrity and it goes back to your own sacred beliefs, um, which what's important to you? Um, what, who do you want to be? So courage then is identifying the source of your anger and angry feelings. And I like to think of anger as an alarm system. It tells us that something is wrong. But what's important is not letting that anger control you. My man who was um, Jewish really emphasized that. He said he didn't want his anger to control him. He wanted to control his anger and use it um, for justice, for good purposes. So what we can do is ask ourselves why. You know, why am I angry? What is, what is the problem? And have the courage to confront whatever that is. We may want to be in what one of the ladies I interviewed called the house of sorrows. And that's where we grieve. And we all have different timelines for how much grieving we need to do. But we want to be able to emerge ready to move forward. Spend our time grieving however much we have to. But be ready to move forward. Accept the reality. Um, but we don't have to like it. There's a lot of things I don't like, 
but I have to <laughs> have to accept it if I want to move on. I use this cartoon because I think it says a lot about how much we hate to admit we're wrong. Um, do you have a card that stops short of saying I'm sorry, yet vaguely hints of some wrongdoing? It's hard to admit we're wrong. It takes a lot of courage. And um, sometimes we just want to vaguely hint at that. Mm -hmm. Compassion is active process. It's not pity. It's actively working to understand a different perspective. Um, and instead of trying to hurt, trying to heal, figuring out a way to heal instead of hurt. And empathy is constantly related to forgiveness, that ability to empathize, to put yourself in someone else's shoes, to not see someone else as an object of hurt, but instead as a fellow human being who's having a hard time um, in whatever way, or has, like um, some of my people said, they're they're just on a, a different developmental path, and you just have to hope that they will be able to find their peace. Accepting the human condition, that was another thing that a number of people mentioned. We have to accept that being human is hard, that um, suffering is part of being human, and that we often behave very badly. But that doesn't mean we can't learn, doesn't mean we can't grow, doesn't mean we can't be transformed and move ahead. It's also important to be able to laugh, <laughs> especially at ourselves. Um, Maxine here is saying that sometimes the first step to forgiveness is understanding the other person is a freaking idiot. And that's part of just understanding that Sometimes people know not what they do. Um, a very heartwarming story told me by um, my Lakota woman who at an early age realized that oftentimes people just didn't understand. She and her grandmother were not um, waited on at a restaurant and her grandma started crying because the waitress was just ignoring her and, and then said that she wouldn't wait on them. And she had the courage actually to to stand up and say, if you don't want our money, we're leaving. We'll go somewhere that did. And she wasn't hateful. She wasn't, um, she just stood up for herself and realized that the person was a freaking idiot um, and didn't realize what was going on. And um, she was able to do that. I think it's also important to laugh at ourselves, to realize that, yeah, sometimes we do really silly, stupid things, but that's okay. Um, and to have compassion. Um, for others and for ourselves. This is poor Kelvin. He's trying his best um, to not be mean. Um, he's being accused of being mean and he's trying, he's trying not to be, um, but he doesn't quite make it. And he ends up calling her a dumb noodle loaf, whatever that is. And um, I included this just to say, it's important to remember we're all doing our best and we mess up and it's important um, to be kind to both ourselves and to others. This C, the fourth C here that I have is creativity. And that is so important. That um, is being able to get out of the rut you're in and see a hurtful event in a new light. Again, you might, you know, you have to grieve. It's you're going to hurt, whatever. But what your goal is, is to create a new a new way of looking at something and I know when I can do that it is such um, a liberating a liberating thing to do the freedom to look at something and um, in a different way and to grow and learn from it many of the people I interviewed talked about giving purpose to their pain some of them who've been abused were able to help others who'd been abused um, wanted to be a good role model for for their loved ones um, wanted to be a light for others, to be able to help others, give your pain purpose. My man who felt so bad about the horrible accident that occurred was able to go ahead and suggest changes to the system and talk to people about how to improve it, give the pain purpose. Gratitude, I found, is huge. At first, when I started researching forgiveness, I, I thought, hmm, is that really that important? And then I had an experience and I really looked at, you know, gratitude is really, really important because that fuels our transformation. If we're so locked with negative thoughts and we can't see anything positive, how can we make change? How can we be creative? What gratitude does, going out for a, a beautiful walk, enjoying morning coffee, being with a friend, any of those things to be grateful for, give you 
you that fuel, that ability to see something in a new way, a creative way that's more positive instead of being um, locked in that personal prison or like one person said, feeling like a rat scurrying around in the dark. And then you can create that new chapter in your life story. Um, you can eventually move on from victim to hero of your life story then. I'll leave you with a few quotes here. Change, um, trauma creates changes we do not choose. We didn't choose 2020. We wouldn't have chosen a lot of the things that happened then, especially for those of us who really experienced some, some horrible hardship and grieving um, during that time. We don't choose those, those things and we're, it's not, they're not our fault. Um, but it is our responsibility then to take ownership of whatever has happened to us and choose healing over hurting. Healing is about creating change you do choose, um, being the hero of your story and being able to look at things in a different way. Again, being compassionate, it's not easy. Being human is hard. Be gentle with yourself, um, but don't give up hope either. I have um, this picture of, of a turtle. And this was one of the things during 2020 that I kept in mind. I had gotten to go to Florida to visit one of my sisters and watch the turtles who have been surviving for millions of years. They're, they are famously slow and slow moving, um, but they keep going. And I got to watch the mothers go up on the beach and give birth. They had to dig a big hole. They had to lay a hundred eggs. Then they had to cover the eggs and then they had to go back out in the ocean, all hopefully before the sun rose. So thankfully some of them were a little slower. And so I got to watch them. And one of the things that they did is they rested in between their activity. They, they rested and recovered as needed, but they kept calm, they kept resilient and they kept going. They kept moving forward, even if it was slow, even if they had to rest and recover um, in between. And their babies did the same. They would go and then they rested. They would go towards the ocean and then they rested once they um, were out of their eggs. And so sometimes I just remind myself of the turtles and, um, and the importance of resting and recovering as needed and being kind to yourself and others because kindness is contagious. And the last quote I'll give you then, and hopefully we'll have some questions, um, is just to keep learning and loving. A big thing that can help us forgive is realizing we're born to learn, not born to perform. We're born to learn. And we're born to, to love each other, not hate each other. Um, and that life is always changing. It's a moving, breathing thing. And we're constantly evolving. And I like the last part of this quote, especially perfection is in fact, constant transformation. Sometimes we just want the world to stand still and that's understandable, but um, we also don't want to get bored. So perfection is that constant transformation, taking whatever comes our way, even if it's unfair, even if it's unjust and, and creating something from it um, that is loving and kind and that allows us to keep, keep learning and growing and being transformed. And I'll stop there so that people can ask questions. Dr. Chris, thank you. I'm holding up a copy of the book, Being Human is Hard, Choose Forgiveness. We will have the book available in the Journey gift shop for you guys, but thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, for your time tonight. And I, I just think that this topic was really important for us to work in here in 2021 uh, for the journey discussions. And I appreciate everybody being out there. All you have to do is uh, type me in a chat. I saw a few hand raises out there. Go ahead and hit us back with the chat. But I, I wanted to share something, Chris, uh, it was in the front part of your book. It was another quote. Uh, from Socrates, in this case, it was the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And change, we were all maybe forced to change or embrace change here in 2020. And my question comes from, 
if um, if we're dealing with someone who needs to learn how to change, how do we guide them when there's also that caution of, you know, we don't want to say just get over it, but we need, how do we help them recognize a change moment? Mm. That could be tricky sometimes, but I find that what people say is the best is just be there to listen and allow people to express their genuine, true feelings. And that sometimes can be hard for us because sometimes we aren't comfortable with people's grief. And so we may be like, I find people will say, apologize for crying or apologize for what they're feeling and allowing people to just be honest about what they're feeling, that there's nothing wrong with that. And, and letting people talk and get those feelings out. Those can, that can be so important because sometimes it's locked inside of us and we don't even understand it maybe. But if we can find someone who will just let us say those things and we feel safe, we feel that they're not going to judge us, um, then we can, we can take care of it ourselves much better. And if we know that someone is going to be there for us, no matter what, um, that, can be, that can be very, very helpful as well. Sharing our story can be good. Um, if we've, like with the role models who shared stories of tough times they had that can be inspiring to others, um, that can also be, be a good thing. But it is important to remember that forgiveness can be done wrong if we pressure people or if we make them somehow feel ashamed of being who they are or, or whatever it is, um, accepting people where they're at and just walking beside them, sharing our story. Um, you maybe hear, heard of wounded healers. That is someone who can share their wounds, um, but not expect someone um, to follow the exact same path, letting them follow the path, whatever their path is. Did right. that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Well, and, and I mean, you know, part of the caution here is, is that because everybody's on their own timelines um i think i think what to summarize what i heard from you is just to always make sure you're a good listener more so than perhaps even trying to steer a mm -hmm. conversation and i i think that's i think that's what we were going for in that conversation um i i think sometimes it's hard for all of us to know exactly if we're ready to move forward uh, to the next level. I mean, uh, I would say that a lot of people I know, just I'll speak from a personal level that sometimes, you know, you're successful because you're determined to make something work. And so that you don't want to change because it's that stubbornness that makes something work sometimes too, where you don't give up. And so it's a real fine line between finding that balance of Okay, now you're just being stubborn and it's not going to go back to the way it was and you need to be adaptive and uh, find the new way to do things. And so that's a that's a tricky balancing point. And I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. I mean, it's hard to know when you're in the middle of that, when to be more stubborn and when to be flexible. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess maybe because it is hard to know and we're going to make some mistakes. Oftentimes we have to learn by experience. Parents know that from trying to tell their children what to do, right? Um, that certain things we have to learn by experience. And so then being gentle and kind to ourselves and to others. One of the, the lady I interviewed who was agnostic had an extremely supportive family. And she mentioned that they were always so good about allowing her to make mistakes and not chastising her for it. But that realization that some things we have to learn by trial and error, some things we have to experience, um, there's not easy answers for everything. And letting, you know, letting ourselves make mistakes and not beating 
either ourselves or someone else up for that, as long as the intention is good. And I guess that's where you have to ask yourself, what's my intention? Is my intention to help others or is my intention just to flatter myself or because I don't want to admit that my ego is hurting or um, my pride is hurting? And so you have to ask yourself those questions as far as, you know, am I really doing this for the good of all, or am I just doing this to further my own agenda? Yes, <laughs> you're right. Um, Chris, I have a question here. It's in regards to journaling. Does journaling assist? Uh, does, it, does it have a role in forgiveness? Yes. I think people have different ways that they need to get things out and journaling can be a wonderful way to do it, especially if there's, you know, if you're, if you're someone who maybe there's no one you really want to feel comfortable talking to about something, you can talk to your journal and journaling is great for a couple reasons. One is it's actually a good critical thinking um, thing because you're forced to write down your thoughts and that helps clarify it. So you're a better thinker when you're actually writing something down and you can clarify that. The other thing is one of the things that gives us that high blood pressure and, and, and um, hurt is that keeping things inside. And when we're able to go ahead and get that out by writing, you know, I know someone who said journaling was just a godsend to him because he could journal and get get things out that way. And after he wrote it down, I'm that way, too. If I write it down, it can be so healing. Um, it just helps me clarify my thoughts. It helps me get it out. Um, and I'm not, it's not locked inside me because it can be like toxic poison when we keep these things inside. We need to get them out in some way. And some of the people I talked to, one person like went to the cemetery and talked to the person that they were having trouble forgiving. Another person wrote that person a letter um, and just got everything out, just cried and cried and wrote the letter to the person that, um, that they had uh, had trouble forgiving and then w was able to burn it in her garden and it was like she was sending it out to the universe. So there's different things like that, that just whatever way you can, you can get that out. And that's why too, if someone wants to cry, let them cry. It's, it's another way of getting those toxins. I'm going to call it out the things that are bothering us out and understanding them. Because again, forgiveness is all about understanding. Why are we feeling that? Why are we feeling this way? What is it that we need to confront so that we can move forward. And so journaling is, is wonderful. That, that was a great question. And I'm glad that that one came up because obviously not always do all of us have someone to go and talk to. And, uh, and, and journaling is a great way to, I guess then too, no one's going to provide you any feedback that would be wrong. Right, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you clarify and, and a lot of it. Yeah, it, it's great. That's why prayer is good. You know, some of the people that spiritual connection, some of the people had, um, you know, actual people they could talk to. But journaling is good. Um, if you have a spiritual connection, that's why prayer is so helpful as well, because again, you are um, lifting your burden. You're getting, you know, you have the, the burden and if you keep it inside and you don't lift it um, and share it, it, it can really harm you. And when you're harmed, the problem is too, hurt people oftentimes then take their hurt out on others. So you don't want to do that either. Um, you want to be able to get that out so that, you know, you don't do something that's going to harm others. Chris, uh, perhaps maybe one last question, unless another one comes in, but over the course of all of your research here, what did you, what, what stands out to you as the most, you know, what just stuck with you as I, I didn't expect to learn this? I think um, one of the biggest insights, I already talked about the importance of gratitude, but humility really um, was big with me because what I found out was that oftentimes we have trouble forgiving, 
um, not just because we're prideful and we don't want to admit we're wrong and we're angry, but often we're, we have trouble forgiving because we don't recognize our strengths. And humility is about recognizing both our weaknesses and our strengths. And if we are not strong, if we um, feel so ashamed that we don't speak up for ourselves, that we keep it all inside, um, we're not going to be able to be forgiving because we're so hurt. We're so hurt and we're keeping it. We're letting people take advantage of us. We're not speaking up for ourselves. We're not using our strength. And so I put it on a continuum in my book. I talk more about it, a humility continuum that for forgiveness to work, we have to not just recognize when we're prideful and we need to, um, recognize our weaknesses, but we also need to recognize our strengths. And one of the ladies said, you have to realize you're just as strong as an import and important as the people who are hurting you. You are just as strong and you are just as important. And that was one of a, the things that I thought was very meaningful to me because sometimes I hadn't really thought of it that way, but just the importance of recognizing your strength, because when you're strong, you can't be hurt and forgiveness is about for, you know, if you're forgiving what's hurt you, but once you're strong, once you've been able to do that and recognize your strengths as well as your weaknesses, because you don't think you're better than somebody else, you're in that middle, you're in that middle area where you're not better than anybody, but you're not worse than anybody either. We're all in this together. We're all one. Um, and we're all human and human is hard. And so that's why we, we should forgive each other. <laughs> and that's the perfect way to segue back to the title of your book, right, Chris? <laughs> there it is. And um, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Chris, for everything again and for being here tonight. And for those of you who are online and watching, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're basically to the top of the hour and we strive to kind of balance everything there. But Dr. Chris, anything else that you'd like to add as we wrap up or are you good? I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and um, share what I've learned. The people that I interviewed were amazing. They gave their time to be interviewed because they knew how important forgiveness was in their life. And they wanted to share that with others. And like Troy, you mentioned in the book. So I have, um, I have 13 stories in the book of the people who have forgiven a variety of things and who had different sacred belief systems, different ages. And um, I focused on what they had in common, which were the four C's then, the connections, courage, compassion, and creativity. But um, I want to thank them all the people and all the people who referred me to them. I had a lot of people who helped me with my research. So I'll just do a big shout out to all the people I interviewed and all the people who helped me um, because they had beautiful stories that continue to inspire me. Well, and I, and I really do think this is important conversations for all of us to be aware of here after it's not just 2020 we're li life is filled with challenges and Chris, you know, I'm always going to be a fan of turtles uh, we, we are big on the turtle here and the journey is doing its own little crawl and rest here as, uh, as we continue to change uh, and move forward. And so I always have to close this way, or do you want to close with the big <laughs> slogan tonight? Uh, but somehow in some way, way. the journey will way. continue. Way. And so we thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, we appreciate you. See you next Thursday for another great journey discussion. You all stay safe. Thanks.